So here we are, 3 Nephi chapter 8. If you look at your scripture page, we've been 422 pages into this Book of Mormon where prophets have been giving signs regarding the coming of the Messiah. And now, over in the old world, he's being crucified, he's being killed, he's performing that infinite atonement, and we get to see the effects in the new world of what the natural disasters are that come as a result of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in the old world. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. Mormon gives us some pretty powerful description of prophets validating and verifying prophet. Look at verse 1, and now it came to pass that according to our record, and we know our record to be true, for behold, it was a just man who did keep the record, for he truly did many miracles in the name of Jesus, and there was not any man who could do a miracle in the name of Jesus, save he were cleansed every whit from his iniquity. So he's saying, look, we can trust this record written by Nephi, this man of God, and he tells you that, verse 5, it came to pass in the thirty and fourth year, in the first month, on the fourth day of the month, there arose a great storm. If we were using a Gregorian calendar, that would be January 4th. We're not using a Gregorian calendar. They're on a totally different calendar system. The point being, it's the fourth day of the very first month of the year. Well, this is where we finally can do a little bit of crossover between the old world and the new world, because we know when Jesus was crucified. He was killed on, or one day, give or take, on Passover. Well, we know when Passover falls. It's the first full moon after the spring equinox every year. So it looks like the Nephite calendar is turning over sometime really close to that spring equinox. Notice the descriptions now that Mormon uses with the storm. Verse 6, there was also a great and terrible tempest, and there was terrible thunder, insomuch that it did shake the whole earth as if it was about to divide asunder. And there were exceedingly sharp lightnings, such as never had been known in all the land. This isn't what you'd call a typical thunderstorm. This is exceedingly sharp lightnings, such as had never been known in all the land. We're, we're into this story over 600 years, and they've never seen anything like this. Notice verse 8, the city of Zarahemna did take fire. Moroni was sunk into the depths of the sea, and the inhabitants thereof were drowned. The earth was carried up upon the city of Moronihah, and in the place there became a great mountain, and there was great and terrible destruction. Brothers and sisters, we don't know all of the details about exactly where the Book of Mormon took place, but when you read the destructions in 3 Nephi chapter 8, wherever it took place, it seems that there is this cataclysmic natural disaster series of events that's unfolding that involves a whole series of things, huge storms that have never been known before from above, earth shaking and quaking from beneath, these exceedingly sharp lightnings. Now, I'm not a geology expert, but I, I've heard quite a few of our, uh, of our geology professors at BYU talk about elements from 3 Nephi 8, and they're all seeing major, major geologic uh, natural disasters taking place. Specifically, think about what happens in a volcano. For fun, Google volcanic lightning sometime and watch some of the videos or look at some of the pictures. Exceedingly sharp lightnings. A volcano can create its own weather pattern and it just, it's shocking. Notice what happened in uh, the state of Washington many years ago when Mount St. Helens erupted. Everybody was expecting this eruption to go up, but it didn't go up. It went out the side. So what used to be Mount St. Helens, now all of a sudden off to the side, there was a small mountain. And if people had had a city that was built anywhere near that area, you could say, as it says in verse 10, the earth was carried up upon the city of Moronihah, that in the place of the city there became a great mountain. You can see the earth swallowing some of the cities with major earthquake and shifting of plates in the plate tectonics going on. 
verse 12, and behold, there was a more great and terrible destruction in the land northward. For behold, the whole face of the land was changed because of the tempests and the whirlwinds and the thunderings and the lightnings and the exceedingly great quaking of the whole earth to the point where 13 describes highways broken up, level roads spoiled, many smooth places became rough, great and notable cities sunk, others burned, many shaken till the buildings had fallen and they were left desolate. How bad were the winds? The whirlwinds, either hurricane or tornado kinds of wind action, verse 16, there were some who were carried away in the whirlwind, and whither they went no man knoweth, save they know that they were carried away. Brothers and sisters, the point here is that the God of nature seems to be unleashing all of the possible natural disasters you could imagine all compounded into one, to the point where this destruction is going on for three hours. Verse 19, he says, now many thought it felt like a lot longer than three hours, but Mormon informs us it, it was about the space of three hours that this terrible destruction was coming, and then behold, darkness came upon the face of the land. You've killed the light of the world over in Jerusalem. There is no more light seen in the Americas for the, the three days. Notice verse 20, it came to pass that there was thick darkness upon all the face of the land, insomuch that the inhabitants thereof, who had not fallen, could feel the vapor of darkness. It's not just that somebody turned out all the lights and there's thick clouds, there's a vapor of darkness. They can feel it in the air. Once again, I'm not an expert, but you look at what happens after major volcanic activity, spewing all of those gases and those ashes and those, those various elements into the air, creates this thick vapor of darkness to the point where they couldn't even light a fire, even with their exceedingly dry and fine wood, they couldn't even get the fire to light. That's interesting. If the air is filled with all of these other gases and they're struggling to just live themselves, they can't even get their fires to start. So they are literally going to sit there in complete darkness during this, this time when the vapor is covering the land. Now, turn over to chapter 9, verse 1. It came to pass that there was a voice heard among all the inhabitants of the earth upon all the face of this land. You'll notice that when you're in a place that is so dark that you can't even see your hand in front of your face, it forces your other senses to maybe be a little more in tune than they otherwise might have been. I can only imagine how it must have felt for these people sitting there in that darkness wondering who's survived, who hasn't, what's happened to their world and all of their exceedingly fine buildings and workmanship and their monies, that's all now taken away, so to speak, as they're sitting there in the darkness, then they hear this voice, woe, woe, woe unto this people. In ancient languages, there are a variety of ways to add emphasis to something or to make something superlative. One of the ways to do that is to repeat a concept two times to add emphasis or three times if you want to give it more of a superlative sense. So when you get a triple woe, oh, that is as woe as you can go. It doesn't get any woeer than that, right? This is the ultimate pronouncement of destruction. By the way, that phrase, the triple woe, you're only going to find it four times in Scripture two times in the Book of Mormon, once in the Doctrine and Covenants, and once in, in the Book of Revelation. So, notice who gets the triple woe here and why. Woe unto the inhabitants of the whole earth, except they shall repent, for the devil laugheth and his angels rejoice because of the slain of the fair sons and daughters of my people. And it is because of the iniquity and abominations that they are fallen. It's not because God is cruel, it's not because God is random and he just, oh, well, looks like something bad just happened. It's because of their iniquities and their abominations that they are fallen. And then he describes, look at the personal pronouns here, verse 3, 
Behold, that great city Zarahemla have I burned with fire. Once again, with a volcano, it's easier to have fire kinds of uh, events or earthquakes if they have torches to fall and light things on fire. There are a variety of ways that that could have happened, but Zarahemla is specifically described as being burned. Look at verse 4. Behold, that great city Moroni have I caused to be sunk in the depths of the sea. Verse 5. He talks about Moroniha being covered with the earth and the inhabitants thereof. Why? To hide their iniquities and their abominations from before my face, that the blood of the prophets and the saints shall not come any more unto me against them. Look at verse 6. City of Gilgal caused to be sunk. 7. Oniha, Mokum, the city of Jerusalem and the inhabitants thereof, and waters have I caused to come up in the stead thereof to hide their wickedness and abominations from before my face that the blood of the prophets and the saints shall not come up any more unto me against them." So, we see a pattern here in 3 Nephi that relates to things we see in the book of Genesis. Well, let me just look at a couple of verses with you here in 3 Nephi chapter 9. Verse 5, that great city Moroniha have I covered with earth and the inhabitants thereof to hide their iniquities and their abominations from before my face, that the blood of the prophets and the saints shall not come any more unto me against them. So it's this interesting thing. It's almost like God does not want to hear the noise of the righteous expressing their grief at the injustices that they are experiencing, that eventually God in his divine justice and divine love finds a way to fix the problem. He covers it. He wipes it out. He erases the problem. If you turn back to Genesis, for example, we have a similar situation. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, and God saw that wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, the heart of mankind, was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord, meaning he felt very sorrowful that he made man on earth and it grieved him at his heart. He was really sad that humans had corrupted this good earth that he had created and corrupted the things that he had tried to provide for them. And so, as we see, he sends the flood to bury the wickedness, to cleanse the wickedness, to erase the wickedness, to wipe out the wickedness. And we hear throughout scriptures, God does not just pull out the weeds right when they pop up. He lets the wheat and the tares grow together, but eventually there will be a reaping. Justice will happen. It doesn't always happen in our timing, but there are prophets who warn us, and if we listen carefully, not only are we warned about potential timings of things that we should be aware of, but far more important, we are continuously reminded that if we repent and turn to the Savior who has his arms open to us, we will be safe. It doesn't mean we will never suffer or no bad things will ever happen to us, but it does mean that we can have the peace of his prosperity, which is having a spirit with us. And ultimately, we will be covered. Now, what's interesting is that God will cover the wickedness, he will destroy it out, but for those who repent, he will actually cover their sins with the blood of his atonement. It's a very powerful thing. So, one way or the other, God's going to cover things. He will cover you in his atoning blood. Baptism is a great representation of that. Now, I think for most of us, we all have a desire to follow Jesus Christ, and the Book of Mormon is preserved for our, our day to remind us that we can have that peace if we turn to him in faith. After Mormon describes these 16 cities that are mentioned by name being destroyed, he then gives us some clarification. Look at verse 13. O all ye that are spared, because ye were more righteous than they. Will you not now return unto me and repent of your sins and be converted that I may heal you? Notice the reason they were spared. It's not because they were righteous. It's because they were more righteous than those who got destroyed. And the people who got destroyed, he describes the kinds of things that they had been doing. They had been rejecting the prophets and killing the prophets. And so he caused these great destructions to come upon the land. Now, his invitation to those who survived all of these these destructive events is, repent, come to me, I'll heal you, I'll save you, 
I'll cleanse you. I'll cover you. And then he, for the first time, this voice in the darkness, and keep in mind it's so dark they can't even light a fire. They can't see any light of any kind, but they can hear the voice of the light of the world. Look at verse 15. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I created the heavens and the earth and all things that in them are. I was with the Father from the beginning. I am in the Father and the Father in me, and in me hath the Father glorified his name. Brothers and sisters, this is the voice of Jesus Christ speaking to these inhabitants of the new world. Well, what just happened in the old world? He just got crucified. So he's now speaking to them, if you take this literally, from the spirit world, having just given up the ghost in the old. It doesn't necessarily have to line up perfectly with the timing over there, but if we read it literally, that's what's going on. Now look at verse 18. I am the light and the life of the world. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I'm the beginning of the world and I'm there at the end of the world. My hand is through it all. Let's talk about this phrase that we've all seen, this Alpha and Omega. In the Greek language, and really in any language that actually has um, an alphabet, not all languages do, um, you have a first letter and a last letter. And in Greek, you have the first letter is alpha. The last letter happens to be the long O, which is, it's actually called omega. It means the big O. And all the letters in the alphabet are between that. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Because he's the author, that gives him authority. You notice that the word author and authority both have author in it. You can't author without letters, and you need all the letters of the alphabet to do that. He's the author and finish of our faith. He writes the story of the plan of salvation. He invites us to participate in that narrative. If we show up, as happens here in the Book of Mormon, and try to become the author ourselves, and to take the narrative in another way, which is like injustice and iniquity, and destroying the people who speak on behalf of God, who is the author, he will eventually say, I have to wipe you off because you aren't the author and you're not the authority. I'm the one who's writing the story of the plan of happiness, the plan of salvation. And so this is kind of what he's saying, like, I am everything and I want to share it fully with you. Just accept it. Just embrace what I've had to offer you instead of rejecting it because of your fallen natures and losing all that I have to offer you. That's just a little insight on what the idea of Alpha and Omega means. We talked about how you'll be buried in water one way or the other, either the waters of mercy at baptism or the waters of justice that God will have to bring upon us if we don't repent. We have a similar thing going on if we look at verse 20 in 3 Nephi chapter 9. And ye shall offer for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and whoso cometh unto me with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, him will I baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost, even as the Lamanites, because of their faith in me at the time of their conversion, were baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. So before I mention the symbolism here, let me just point out the word fire. I find this really quite powerful. And the word pure actually come from the same root. To become pure you need fire, and fire purifies. So just like we will either be baptized or buried, mercy or justice, the same thing with fire. We see it right here in 3 Nephi 9. Either we can accept the purging, purifying fire of the Holy Ghost, which brings the atonement into our lives, or we will get the fire of justice, get the fire of mercy, Holy Ghost, or the fire of justice, as we saw, for example, the city of Zarahemla burned. And so we have these symbols that are going on in the scriptures, and God is trying to teach us you have a choice. There are two ways. You can choose the right hand of God, or you can choose not to be on any side of God and to be kept out of his presence. Now, you'll notice that in verse 10, the earth did cleave together again, that it stood and the mourning and the weeping and the wailing of the people who were spared alive did cease, and their mourning was turned into joy. 
and their lamentations into the praise and thanksgiving unto the Lord Jesus Christ, their Redeemer. I like that pattern. They take time to mourn and lament. They're sad, but at this point, they now recognize there's a lot of work to do, so they now move forward towards Christ. Verse 11, and thus far were the scriptures fulfilled which had been spoken by the prophets. And it was the more righteous part of the people who were saved, and it was they who received the prophets and stoned them not. And it was they who had not shed the blood of the saints who were spared. Towards the end of this chapter, in verse 18, Mormon interjects some editorial comments where he says, and it came to pass that in the ending of the thirty and fourth year, remember when the destruction started? It was on day four of the thirty and fourth year. So here he's saying, at the ending of the thirty and fourth year, behold, I will show unto you that the people of Nephi who were spared and also all those who had been called Lamanites who had been spared did have great favors shown unto them and great blessings poured out upon their heads. So what we have here is, if this is your thirty and fourth year, you have day four here, and he's saying sometime in the ending of the thirty and fourth year there are great favors shown unto the people, so this would be like eleven months later. However, he then adds this other line that says, insomuch that soon after the ascension of Christ into heaven, he did truly manifest himself unto them. Jesus come right away, right after the, the destructive events listed here. Was it in, you know, that right after the three days of being in the spirit world and then coming out of the grave? Was it soon after the ascension? Was it the ending of the thirty and fourth year? Mormon seems to leave some options open here. All we get are some bookend possibilities. So we know that Jesus is crucified, we, we would assume that that's where the destruction is taking place and then the three days of darkness as he as he's um, on the cross and then in the tomb for three more days, which would be day seven in our year, and then we know that the ascension over in the old world occurs after about 40 days with the apostles and the saints, the women and, and men over there in the old world, and then is the ascension into heaven. So is it soon after that ascension right in here? Is it near the ending that 3 Nephi 11 occurs when he comes? At the end of the day, I would just leave it somewhere in this range, which isn't a very big period of time, but somewhere in there Jesus is going to come uh, and visit these people. But there seems to be a natural break right here for Mormon. Notice he says at the very end of verse 19, therefore for this time, I make an end of my sayings. So he's taking an editorial break from his record keeping. Maybe he has to go fight another battle. Maybe uh, Mrs. Mormon is going to have a little baby boy at this point. I don't know. We don't know. But he's going to take a little bit of a break and he'll come back to it. So when he picks it back up, it's going to be in 3511. Now, what's the therefore what for chapters 8, 9, and 10 filled with all of this destruction? I think Taylor has stated it. Uh, as best we can, as we can say it. God will cover our sins. God will cover our weakness. We can either choose to go to him and ask him to cover those sins and those weaknesses, or we can continue to glory in those sins and those weaknesses. One way or another, they're going to get covered. One way is pleasant, the other way is not. Just know that God is is in charge. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the Lord of the outstretched arms, inviting us to come under the wings of his safety. I want to share with you some things that I know. I have felt the power of the love of Jesus Christ in my life. I have felt the true power of the atonement in my life, and I know that Jesus Christ is my personal Savior, and I know that that is a blessing for all people, that he is the savior for all of God's children. We live in a world with a lot of challenges and confusion and difficulty. There is purity and peace in Jesus Christ. And the Book of Mormon was written and preserved to testify to us that we can fully trust Jesus Christ. And as we do, we can feel the power and the peace that comes from being immersed in his love. 
and I invite you to feel his love in your life, and I know that it is real. Third Nephi chapter 11, verse 1. It begins by telling us that there's a great multitude of people gathered together round about the temple, which is in the land bountiful. So, people in great numbers are gathering to come to the temple in the land bountiful. And this is following Third Nephi chapter 8, 9, and 10, this, this great destruction. Notice what it tells us. They're marveling and wondering one with another, showing one to another the great and marvelous change which had taken place. I believe that they're talking about the change in the land and the buildings and the destruction and the things that, that are now looking different. But there's another change that's taken place. It's not the, the specific focal point of verse 1, but for me, it's one of the most critical parts of verse 1. The greater change that's taken place is the change that's in their heart, not the change in the land, as great and marvelous as those changes may be in the physical world. The reality is, is now they're focused differently than they were back in 3 Nephi 7. They're now focused on coming to the temple. They're focused on talking about Jesus Christ. Look at verse 2. They were also conversing about this Jesus Christ of whom the sign had been given concerning his death. It's in that setting where we now get this incredible uh, experience, which you might be able to refer to 3 Nephi 11 through 27 as the Holy of Holies of the Book of Mormon, in that this whole time up to these pages, we've been waiting for and anticipating the coming of the Savior to the world, and uh, he's finally here, and these people get to come into his presence and have this experience. Here's how it begins. Verse 3, it came to pass that while they were thus conversing one with another, they heard a voice as if it came out of heaven, and they cast their eyes round about, for they understood not the voice which they heard. And then he goes on to describe the voice, not being harsh, neither was it a loud voice, and it was a small voice, but it did pierce them that did hear to the very center, and it caused their whole souls to quake and their hearts to burn. Did you notice what happened? You have a large multitude of people gathered at the temple. They hear a heavenly voice come to them, and what was their response? They didn't understand. They heard a voice speaking, but they didn't understand it. So what was their response? They cast their eyes round about, for they understood not the voice. They're looking horizontally. They're, they're scanning the crowd, probably with a confused look on their face, like, I, I'm hearing something, but I have no idea what it is, and I'm looking around this vast multitude horizontally, and what am I looking for? I'm looking for somebody who has a look of understanding, a look of recognition, a look of, hey, I know exactly what's, what's being said. The reality is, is every one of those people in that great multitude is just as confused as everybody else in the multitude. They're all looking for answers horizontally when impressions have come vertically. You'll notice they're not, they're not looking up in verse 3. And so consequently, they end up just as confused at the end of verse 3 as they are at the beginning of verse 3. Now, it's easy for us to read the scripture like this and say, why are they doing that? Can't they figure this out? <laughs> but be very careful when you point fingers of scorn or judgment into the past, or when you try to judge people in the past based on modern day standards or norms or, or societal uh, uh, perspectives. Because whenever you point a finger of scorn at somebody, you've probably heard this before, you've got three pointing back at you. Look at verse 4. It came to pass that again they heard the voice, and they understood it not. These people aren't terribly different than we are today. We hear things, we get messages from heaven, and we don't understand them always at first, and instead of going to the source, our societal knee-jerk response is to do exactly what they did in verse 3, which is to look horizontally. We just don't do it quite as uh, in person as they maybe are doing it in verse 3, 
we turn horizontally by grabbing things like Google or texting or turning horizontally through digital means to see if somebody can tell me how to live my life or how to make sense of the confusion that I'm facing. I love this next verse because it shows me a pattern of what we can do better as a society, as a culture today as individuals and as families. Look at verse 5. Look at the difference between verse 5 and those previous two attempts. And again, the third time they did hear the voice and did open their ears to hear it and their eyes were towards the sound thereof. Brothers and sisters, they, the voice didn't change. It's not as if God was speaking a foreign language in verse 1 or in verse 3 and 4 and then spoke their language in verse 5. God saying the same thing in verse 3, 4, and 5 would be my assumption. The only thing that changed is they opened their ears to hear it and they turned their eyes towards the sound thereof. They looked heavenward. They stopped relying on each other to interpret what it was that they were supposed to do and they looked to God. That's the only change. Now it says, behold, the third time they did understand the voice which they heard and then he's going to tell you what it says here. Applying that to us today, brothers and sisters, is, is a really powerful principle. We can tune our ears to the voices of the world's experts, to the voices of people who maybe self-proclaim that they've got things figured out and they'll tell you exactly how to live your life and how to, how to make decisions. Or we can have our knee-jerk response be to tune our ear upward, open our ears to hear the words of the Lord and to turn heavenward with our eyes and focus first there. That doesn't mean he's not going to inspire us to use horizontal sources. They have their place. It's just that we start by turning to God, looking to God, trusting in the Lord with all our heart and leaning not on our own understanding and other people's understanding or trusting in the arm of flesh. It's trusting in the almighty hand of God. Here's what the voice says. Behold my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom I have glorified my name. Hear ye him. You'll notice um, that whenever the voice of the Father is recorded in Scripture, he's usually introducing the Son. Whether it's at the baptism of Jesus, the Mount of Transfiguration, here in 3 Nephi 11, at the sacred grove with Joseph Smith, the Father seems to be most interested in testifying of the divine nature of his only begotten Son. And you'll notice in the times when the Father is introducing the Son, he always uses the word beloved. If you want to be more like Heavenly Father, don't just love people, but express your love for people. Heavenly Father, every single time he introduces the Son, he calls him his beloved Son. Cognitively, Jesus would know that Heavenly Father loves him, but oh, how it must make him feel when he hears the Father express that love for him. As human beings, we love hearing people say things like, well done, thou good and faithful servant, or I love you, or this is my beloved. That just, it just motivates us. Love is the single greatest motivator. It's not fear. It's not hope of some grand reward. It's love. I love seeing in scriptures that love being expressed and reciprocated. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, and that love is very, very apparent throughout these stories. Now, verse 8, after they hear this introduction, they look up and they see a man descending from the heavens dressed in a white robe, it says, and he came down and stood in the midst of them, in the middle of them, and every eye is on him and they're saying, oh, don't say anything because an angel just showed up. I like this because it, it teaches a principle that in verse 7, they heard the voice of the Father introducing his beloved Son. Then they saw this man descending and they think it's an angel. In other words, they understood what the Father said in verse 7, but they didn't understand what the Father meant. And he's okay with that. 
He's okay with taking us where we are, stretching us to the next level, and then the next level, line upon line, precept on precept. God's very patient. Thank heaven for God's patience with us in our progression to come to know him, to come to understand him, and come to understand ourselves, and come to progress in our, in our journey of faith, in our quest of discipleship in life. So, these people are sitting there, they're thinking, this is an angel, and then this angel stretches out his hand and says, behold, I am Jesus Christ, whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. And then notice how he introduces the rest of his identity. Behold, I am the light and the life of the world, and I have drunk out of that bitter cup which the Father hath given me, and have glorified the Father in taking upon me the sins of the world, in the which I have suffered the will of the Father in all things from the beginning. Something very interesting happens. Now to introduce this, for those of you who have been in a setting where the prophet of God enters the room, you know what happens, and it happens instinctively. It just happens spontaneously. Everybody stops talking and stands up very reverently when God's prophet enters the room. When God's Son comes into, uh, uh, into your presence, the opposite occurs. Everybody stopped talking, and they're, they're standing there, and the minute they knew who he really was, you'll notice the response of the crowd, verse 12. It came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, the whole multitude fell to the earth, for they remembered that it had been prophesied among them that Christ should show himself unto them after his ascension into heaven. They're not standing, they're not running up to, to give him an embrace. They're humbly and reverently falling to the ground, remembering, oh, the prophets told us that he was going to come, and, and he's here, and I'm here. I'm in his presence. So you can picture this. Probably earlier in the morning, because of all the events that have to take place in this, in this day, here at the temple, great multitude, you can picture it, all these people on the ground with Jesus standing in their midst. You can imagine the thoughts and the feelings going through their hearts and their minds on the ground. And then they hear him say this, verse 14, Arise and come forth unto me, that you may thrust your hand into my side, and also that you may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth, and have been slain for the sins of the world. Wait a minute. I thought they already knew who he was. The Father introduced him. Now he came down himself, then he stretched out his hand and told them who he was. They already know who he is. But he said he wanted them to come up to touch the marks, the wounds, so that they would know that he is the God of Israel. Once again, Christ taking them from one level of understanding, one level of knowledge, one level of testimony and faith to the next. And this is all happening in very rapid succession. It was my good friend Mark Wright who shared this insight that in the old world, in the Bible, when the resurrected Lord appears to people in the New Testament, he invites them to come and fill the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet, and then fill the wounds in his side so that they would know that he had been crucified, slain for the sins of the world. Mark pointed out that in the Book of Mormon, when Jesus appears, the first invitation is for them to thrust their hand into his side, then to fill the marks of the, the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet. In a New World context, human sacrifice is performed by, by cutting into the heart, not by crucifixion. So, it's one of those little subtle differences between the biblical and the Book of Mormon accounts that just stays beautifully lined up with their cultures. The connecting point for people in the Americas to know that Jesus had been slain for the sins of the world was to first be invited to touch, to, to thrust their hands into that wound in the side. Now, this is very sacred ground that we're treading on. Chapter 11, verse 15 is my personal favorite verse of scripture in all of the canon that we have. 
including Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants. This is my single favorite verse. And it came to pass that the multitude went forth and thrust their hands into his side and did fill the prints of the nails in his hands and in his feet. And this they did do, going forth one by one until they had all gone forth and did see with their eyes and did fill with their hands and did know of a surety and did bear record that it was he of whom it was written by the prophets that should come. You'll notice that uh, often in our video and our, our visual depictions of 3rd Nephi 11, we'll often portray Jesus coming through a crowd slowly and his hands are outstretched and the crowd is there and they'll reach through and they'll, they'll touch his hands as he passes through or passes by them. I guess it could have happened like that at other times during this event, but verse 15 to me is very clear that it's a multitude that was gathered there at the temple and the multitude went forth. They came forth, but how did they do it? One by one. So it wasn't a crowd experience with Christ. It was everyone in the crowd got to have an experience with Christ one-on-one. -on -one. Now, we don't know because Mormon doesn't include that detail here. How did this occur? There, there are a lot of options. You you've, could have spontaneously people coming up one by one. You could have a line forming. You could have family groups coming up and then one by one. We don't know how the actual mechanics of this experience took place. We know that each individual got one-on-one -on -one time. So rather than focusing on what we don't know, let's focus on what we do know. Every person gets to spend one-on-one -on -one time with the Savior, where they get to interact with, with him personally and to feel the, the wounds in his side and in his hands and feet. The question is, what would you say to the Lord if you had that one-on-one -on -one time? How would you respond? What, what would you ask? What would you do? The older I've gotten and the more I've thought through this scenario, the more I've thought to myself, I don't know that I would be able to say anything. There are a million things I'd want to say, but I don't know that I'd be able to say any of them because of, of inability to express them physically and emotionally. Here's the reality. Every one of you, every one of us, are going to have this opportunity one day uh, in the next life. And for some, it, it might happen in this life. But we'll at least all get this opportunity one-on-one -on -one with the Savior in the next life. The beauty of this experience is that I don't think Jesus is asking these individuals and that he's going to ask you to interact with the, the elements of his infinite atonement to, to make us feel guilty or to gloat over how much he's done for us. I think he's going to give us this opportunity so that we feel one-on-one -on -one just a small portion of the price that he paid for me and for you, one-on-one. -on -one. He will not, on those moments, be looking into people's faces with questioning eyes, wondering what it's like to be you and to struggle with the, the unique combinations of, of trials and tribulations that you've faced in your life. He is the only one who perfectly understands what you're going through. He will look with knowing eyes and with hands and arms of mercy to encircle us in. Can you imagine the, the aftermath of this, this whole group of people came through one by one. Now they're, they're finished with that experience. This great multitude have, have all had this one-on-one -on -one experience. Now what? They had been told by the Father, this is my beloved Son. They had seen him come down. They had heard him say, I, I'm him. This is me. I'm Jesus Christ, the one that all these prophets have been testifying of, and I've, I've completed this atonement. But now they got to experience it personally one-on-one. -on -one. And now after that happens, look at verse 17. They're all crying with one accord saying, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Most High God. And they did fall down at the feet of Jesus and did worship him. Taylor, what do you have to say about Hosanna? It's a word that we all love. We do Hosanna shouts at temple dedications when a new prophet has been called. 
And I just love how these people have been talking about the mighty changes, and then they have this experience of hearing God the Father, seeing Jesus, and they're silent. And the very first thing they say after experience Jesus is Hosanna. Beautiful word. Hosanna comes from two Hebrew words. The Hosa or Hosea actually is where the name Jesus comes from. We don't have to get into all how that changes, but Jesus's name is actually packed into this part of the word. And na actually means please. And Hosanna in some ways is like Jesus, please. Or Jesus's name really means to save. His name is the testimony of what he does for us. And so to say Hosanna is salvation, please, or Jesus, please, or Jesus save us, which is actually what he had done. And they're just spontaneously saying that. And so whenever you have a moment to think about what God has done for you, you can just say he has saved me and Hosanna conveys that sense. It's a beautiful, powerful, and very simple witness from the people about Jesus culminating this whole cycle of Jesus coming down to demonstrate he has saved them. Isn't it interesting that, that uh, as Taylor mentioned, we, we do the Hosanna shout when we dedicate a temple and uh, when we sustain a new prophet um, and at other special occasions in the church. But these are opportunities for us collectively as a group to plead with heaven for salvation for the earth, for all of us. And at this point, you'll notice in verse 17, after they had all shouted together, Hosanna, they all fell down at the feet of Jesus and did worship him. Did you notice this? This is the second time that they've been on the ground. They fall in verse 17, and it was back in verse 12 when they fell the first time. If you contrast this for a second, first time they fell seemed to be out of reverence, out of respect and awe, and maybe a bit of surprise. The fall in verse 17, to me, feels a lot more worshipful, more intentional. This feels kind of like a reaction. This feels like an action in verse 17 where they are now worshiping him with all of their heart, might, mind, and strength, pleading with him for salvation. I don't know that they're concerned at this point about the brand name of clothing they're wearing or the number of uh, uh, followers they have or the, the amount of prestige they have or power or money or any of that. I think their focus has been taken off of the world's perspective, these horizontal things, and it's now turned vertically like they did back in the beginning of the chapter, and they're focused on Christ. They're focused on what really matters most, and they want to be saved. Isn't it interesting that uh, his response to that petition, to that, that group petition for salvation, is for him to call a prophet up to come before him, Nephi. So Nephi comes, he bows down, kisses the feet of the Lord, and then the Savior raises him up and tells him that he's going to give him authority to baptize the people. And he tells them in verse 23, Verily I say unto you that whoso repenteth of his sins through your words and desireth to be baptized in my name, on this wise shall ye baptize them. And then he gives him the instructions of how to baptize them. Notice the connection. They pled for salvation. Nothing else mattered to them at this point. They've, they've had this experience with Christ and they don't want it to ever uh, be forgotten. And they want to be able to be with him forever. And so he says, okay, you want that? First thing we need to do is establish this covenantal connection with me. Let me teach you how to baptize and give proper authority to a person to be able to be authorized to do those baptisms. So, after teaching him how to baptize, he then tells them, oh, don't let there be any disputations among you. Look at verse 29. For verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hath the spirit of contention is not of me, but is of the devil, who is the father of contention. And he stirreth up the hearts of men to contend with anger one with another. 
Jesus comes to unify, to bring together. Does that mean that we have to be the same? Do we have to think exactly the same as everybody? No, but we need to be at one with him and with each other as much as possible, united in, in causes moving forward rather than divided and contending with anger one with another. As a precursor, fourth Nephi, when the Nephites and the Lamanites finally get to that point where we have 200 years of a perfect Zion society, the number one attribute of that society that Mormon mentions, he, he men he's going to mention it four times, and we'll talk about this when we get to fourth Nephi, is that there was no contention among them. That people figured out how to stop fighting, how to talk, how to come together and to be unified and not be filled with the spirit of contention which the, the Savior tells them comes from the devil. Then, as you turn the page over, look at verse 32. This is my doctrine, and it is the doctrine which the Father hath given unto me. Now, pause there and look over at verse 39, right across from it. Verily I say unto you that this is my doctrine, and whoso buildeth upon this buildeth upon my rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. This is my doctrine, this is my doctrine, 32 to 39. What you have is this bookends. 32 to 39. In biblical studies, they would call this technique inclusio. It's this inclusion. It's giving you the beginning and the end so that you know this is the definition of my gospel. So if you ever want to know on a, on a silver platter what is the gospel of Jesus Christ, look at what the Savior said his gospel is and he bookends on it for us so we know exactly what it is. He tells us that the Father commandeth all men everywhere to repent and believe in me. You'll notice back in 32, even before that, he bore record of the Father. And the Holy Ghost beareth record of the Father and of me, and I bear record that the Father commandeth all men everywhere to repent and believe in me. Isn't that interesting? The Savior loves testifying of the Father and of the Holy Ghost. The Father loves testifying of the Savior and the Holy Ghost's whole mission is to testify of the Father and of the Son. They truly are one. They truly are united, and they've shown us a pattern of what they expect of all of us collectively as well. Notice after we, we repent and believe in him, verse 33, whoso believeth in me and is baptized, the same shall be saved, and they are they who shall inherit the kingdom of God. And whosoever believeth not in me and is not baptized shall be damned. Verse 35, I say unto you, this is my doctrine, and I bear record of it from the Father. He then gives more descriptions of the Godhead and their testifying of each other in verse 36. And then back to the repenting and being baptized in verse 37. And an additional time, repenting and baptizing in verse 38. If you wonder why we talk in the church so much about faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance and baptism and gift of the Holy Ghost and this enduring to the end on that covenant path, it's because that's his doctrine. Now look what he says in this next verse, 40. Whoso shall declare more or less than this and establish it for my doctrine, the same cometh of evil and is not built upon my rock. But he buildeth upon a sandy foundation, and the gates of hell stand open to receive such when the floods come and the winds beat upon them. Therefore, go unto this people and declare the words which I have spoken unto the ends of the earth. These are the things that he wants us to emphasize. I want to finish today's uh, segment in a very non-traditional way. As you go back in your mind now to this, this whole overview of 3rd Nephi 11, the experiences that these people have had, that the multitude got to come forth one by one and have this experience with the Lord Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior of all mankind, but at that moment it wasn't about him being the Savior of the multitude. It was about him being the personal Savior and Redeemer of each individual as they came and had some time to interact with him one by one. On that day, there would have been some who would have come forward who probably needed Jesus to, to smile at them and to prop them up. There might have been others who needed Jesus to just hold them close after they had touched the wounds. 
and to just hug them. There may have been others who needed Jesus to give them lots of words of encouragement or words of of affirmation. The point is this. Jesus isn't just a one-size-fits-all being. He's not a statue. He's not a, a series of paintings. He's a divine, perfected, glorified, resurrected God. He knows everything about us. He knows more about you than you know about you. You don't have to to explain why you, you've done what you've done or who you are. He, he understands that. And in this moment, Jesus can be exactly what each individual needs him to be so that they feel of the Father's love and of his love and feel that all of the, the testifying witness of the Holy Ghost in their heart through this whole process. I spoke earlier about many of our visual representations of 3 Nephi 11 showed Jesus walking through a crowd and them trying to touch him. One of my favorite representations of this actually comes in the form of a slideshow by a a photographer named Mark Mabry who, uh, with the help of Clyde Bowden or Bowden, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, um, beautiful music. He's uh, given us permission to use some clips from this video that they prepared called Another Testament of, of Christ. As you watch the first few minutes of this, uh, I want you to notice how Mark has portrayed the events that take place here in 3511 as well as uh, some of them later on in chapter 17 of how Jesus in these portrayals interacts one by one with individuals as they come forth unto him. And you'll notice those various uh, um, needs that different people had and how, how the Lord responds. finish today's lesson by telling you some things that I know. I've never had the experience described in 3 Nephi 11 of of kneeling at the Savior's feet or touching the marks of the, the nails in his hands or his feet or the wound in his side. But brothers and sisters, I know, as much as I know that I'm alive today, that Jesus is the Christ, that he is our Savior and our Redeemer, and the only solution to our problems, both personally and collectively. I know that he sits enthroned in yonder heavens on the right hand of the Father. He's full of mercy. He's full of love. He's full of power. And he's filled with grace. And as we turn our ears, 
our eyes, our minds, and our hearts heavenward, He will help us to, to understand and to know and to become who we were intended to become as we work through the trials and the tribulations and the temptations and the sins and the difficulties that, that we face in our life. The more I learn about Jesus Christ, the more I love him. And the more I love him and learn of him, the more I want to be like him. He lives. I know he lives. And we leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.